Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. In this episode, I'd like to talk about Christ the Bridegroom, or Jesus the Bridegroom, because we just finished a liturgical year, and in those last few weeks of ordinary time, the sacred scriptures spoke often of our Lord under this title of Bridegroom, or the parables referred to him in that fashion. And it had me thinking back to a course that I took while I was in formation, a course called Nuptial Mystery in the Gospel of John. It wasn't actually at the House of Studies, it was across the street at the JP2 Institute Marriage and Family. And I took it there with Father Paolo Prosperi, uh, who's great. Uh, he's a priest associated with Communion and Liberation. And he assigned us a book in that class by Dr. Brant Petrie called Jesus the Bridegroom. So what you're about to hear is a little bit of Prosperi, a little bit of Petrie, a little bit of me. Uh, insofar as I may have remembered and may have forgotten some of the things that they shared. So I hope that that makes for a good mix, but here we go. We'll find out. Woohoo! Okay, so when approaching this question, I think a good place to start is in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus is asked, okay, why don't your disciples fast? And he responds, well, excuse me, the questioner asks first in terms of other groups of disciples. So he refers to the Pharisees and then he refers to those disciples of John the Baptist. And he says, you know, both of them fast, but yours don't. To which our Lord responds, it does not pertain to the friends of the bridegroom or to like the friends of the bridal chamber to fast while the bridegroom is with them. But there will come a time when the bridegroom is taken from them and then they will fast. So he's appealing here to a Hebrew tradition, right? A tradition proper to the people from whom he originates that you wouldn't fast while the bridegroom is with what we would effectively call today like the bridal party but that after his marriage, uh, when you have lost him effectively to his wife, though probably would not have been put in those terms, then it would be appropriate to fast. But there's a time during which fasting is suspended and uh, that we are in the midst of that time now during our Lord's uh, public ministry. So it's a kind of strange response, a cryptic response, but it leads us to approach the scriptures with this understanding that Christ is identifying himself as a bridegroom. So if that's the case, then God, by inspiring the scriptures, has probably left some indication of his plan which will culminate in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who bears for us the grace of Trinitarian communion, his, his own grace, right? Uh, so let's take a look back in the sacred scriptures and see if we can identify some of those themes which will lead up to our, our recognition of him and our reception of the gifts that he gives. Okay, so... Um, oftentimes, God's relationship with Israel, I wouldn't say oftentimes, all the time, it's described in terms of covenant, okay? So you've probably heard what a covenant is, and you've probably heard it described way better than I can do. So Dr. Scott Hahn speaks about covenant theology with great frequency. But, you know, in a covenant, God, uh, like, espouses himself to his people in a peculiar way. He promises them a fidelity which is unfailing, which is unconditional. So, though we be faithless, yet he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So, you'll often hear that language in the scriptures that God swears by himself. He swears by his own immutable nature. Um, so, God promises to be faithful to Israel come hell or high water. So, uh, we see this covenant well, we see this covenant first founded, you know, in the Adamic covenant and then refounded in the Noahic covenant. And then you see it throughout the Old Testament. But in a special way, we look to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the book of Genesis. And then in the book of Exodus, you have a very formative moment when after Israel passes through the Red Sea, they sing their song of exultation. They begin their march through the desert, which was going to last them 40 years. Right. And at the heart of that book. Right? They're given the law. They're given the covenant. So Moses goes up on the mountain. He consorts with God, whether he sees him or does not see him. You have different accounts there, which highlight the different aspects of our relationship with the Most High, who is ineffable and yet intimate. Um, and at the culmination of that exchange, right, God calls his people in assembly, in a kahal, I think is the Hebrew word, and ekklesia, which is the Greek word, in a church, if we're kind of updating it for present purposes. And then you have what effectively is a sealing of a covenant, um, and it's done by a variety of ritual gestures, but one of which is the sprinkling of blood. So you would sacrifice animals. Well, you would kill an animal. You would drain it of its blood. You would splash some of that blood on the altar, signifying God's part, and then some of that blood on the people, signifying the part played by Israel itself. And then they all effectively sit down to what is a wedding feast. 
So there's the sense that God has formed a covenant with his people. He has promised to be faithful, and it's furnished in terms of a kind of betrothal or espousal, all right, and leading towards a kind of wedding. Now, when we look towards the prophets, okay, you see also this imagery of marriage, fidelity and infidelity arise. Perhaps the most striking example of it is Hosea, who is instructed to marry a harlot so as to signify by this prophetic sign the infidelity of Israel who goes after other gods. So it's fascinating that regardless of what the sins are that Israel commits, Sisrael, I guess those, that's sinning Israel, Sisrael. I'm just making stuff up over here. So regardless of the specific nature of the sin committed by the people of Israel, whether we're talking about apostasy or idolatry or, you know, failure to take care of the widowed and the orphaned or murder or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's often likened to adultery because effectively it's, it's proving oneself unfaithful to the God who has espoused himself to you. And when you do that, you're effectively stepping outside of the bond. So there's a sense, you know, of defilement that goes with that. Um, and obviously you have lots of references to impurity, which is a super important theme there in the Old Covenant. So there's this sense, though, that God's covenant, which proves faithful, even though you have, you know, ages and ages of very bad kings who go up to the high places to worship foreign gods and introduce them into a local pantheon, which does not adequately represent the sovereignty um, of the Lord God. Um, so you have the sense, though, that, that the, it's the bridegroom who makes the bride holy, that makes the bride pure, uh, to make them effectively pure and spotless without stain or wrinkle. And in light of all of these failures of Israel, you have in the later prophets, you can think here of like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, a promise to make with them a new covenant, okay? So this is a covenant which will replace their stony hearts with a fleshy heart, with a natural heart. This is a covenant which will be written on that aforementioned heart. Okay, so this is something that's going to be interiorized. This is something that is going to be made more intimate still. <clears throat> so that's the promise. And when Christ arrives, right, when he takes to himself human flesh, when he is born of a woman born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, he takes to himself all of this foretelling, all of this prophecy, and he is its fulfillment, right? So, um, He's announced by John the Baptist in these terms, right? So who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly at his voice, okay? So you think here, you know, Gospel of John, I think it's chapter 3, when St. John says that he must increase and I must decrease. There's the sin that St. John the Baptist sees himself as a friend of the bridegroom whose sole purpose or sole ministerial purpose is to point awesomely and adamantly at the bridegroom who corresponds to the needs and wants of the people of Israel who have strayed from their bridegroom God. Um, and then you can think again of the miracle of the wedding feast to Cana. I recorded a video about that like a billion years ago, it seems like, but it's probably only like six months. Um, so the miracle of the wedding feast of Cana, you have this grand gesture, the first of his public signs in the Gospel of John, of which there are six before the seventh, which is the resurrection, towards which they all point and in which they all culminate. And in this gesture, he blesses married love. <clears throat> so they run out of wine. It's the responsibility at the wedding feast of the bridegroom. That is a strange pause to make in the middle of a sentence. It is the responsibility of the bridegroom to provide wine for the wedding feast. Okay, And so the bridegroom is not yet conscious of the fact that the wine has run out, whereas Christ is you know, made conscious of that fact by his mother, to whom he responds, what is it to me and to you? Uh, but then he consorts with the head waiter. They have six large stone jars, which are typically used for, you know, purity washing, right? So ritual washing, each of which could contain between 20 and 30 gallons of wine. He has them filled with water to the brim, and then the head waiter dips from them. It's taken to him. Excuse me. One of the waiters dips from it. It's taken to the head waiter who tests it and says, you've kept the best wine for the end. So our Lord, at the behest of his mother, at the suggestion of his mother, supplies wine for the wedding feast, which is the task of the bridegroom, and shows himself a bridegroom beyond compare. All right, And in that conversation with his mother, what does he make reference to? He makes reference to his hour. I think it might be his first reference to his hour. I think it is. Um, so what is it to me and to you, woman? My hour has not yet come. So within that setting, he's blessing married love. He's performing the task of the bridegroom. He's also giving indication of his hour, which hour is the hour of his, pa his passion and death. Okay, So it's wed in that way to what is foretold. Um, 
You can think there of like the Last Supper, for instance, when our Lord performs this ritual action in union with what will transpire on the next day, as if by one event, okay, because it's memorializing what is yet to take place with an eye towards its future dispensation. So you have something similar here with this blessing of married love, his supplying of wine for the wedding feast in the person of the bridegroom, uh, but whilst pointing towards his hour when he will supply the greatest wine for the wedding feast from his pierced side, and when he will perform the task of the bridegroom God to utmost perfection. So then, you know, this other example, the fasting question comes up, which we led with, right? When our Lord says it's not for the friends of the bridegroom, the friends of the bridal chamber to fast while the bridegroom is with them, but there will come a time when he is taken from them and then they will fast. Okay, so ordinarily the friends of the bridegroom would suspend their fasting in preparation for the wedding, but after the wedding had taken place, they would resume their fasting. <clears throat> so our Lord is saying, I'm going to be taken from them, and then they're going to fast. When is he taken from them? He's taken from them at his passion and death, right? He comes back briefly after his resurrection and then ascends into heaven. So just thinking of all those events, passion, death, resurrection, you can add descent into hell, uh, or burial, descent into hell, preaching to the damned, his resurrection, his ascension, his seating at the right of the Father, and his judging in glory. You can think of all those as you know pertaining to the Paschal mystery. Some people go as far as the sending of the Spirit. But he's pointing to that as a wedding. All right, so the betrothal, the espousal, which begins uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, I mean, which begins in God's creation of Adam and Eve, but which you see solemnized at the foot of Mount Sinai, is brought to its fulfillment, it's brought to its perfection through the Paschal mystery. When the bridegroom God gives that new covenant, the one which will replace the stony heart with the fleshy heart, which will be written interiorly and intimately, because in that our Lord gives the new law, which is just the grace of the Holy Spirit, right? Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the grace of the Holy Spirit, which Christ pours into our hearts by the sending of his spirit, which rests on him as his anointing, which we read about in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 2 through 3 and beyond. Um, so, when our Lord is making all of these connections, he's, you know, performing a kind of prophetic gesture of his own, but he's embodying it, he's inhabiting it, he's bringing it to its perfection, to its completion and fulfillment. So, this is the hour. This is when the bridegroom God is wed to his people most perfectly in Christ, who has already wed himself to our flesh in his person by the hypostatic union, but then weds himself to us yet further through the Paschal mystery by showing how manifestly God loves us and by performing this act of satisfaction, sacrifice, redemption, which merits for us our salvation, which merits can be applied throughout the course of time and space so that we can draw near to him who has drawn near to us. So the passion, he lays down his life right? Which in Ephesians 5, we have identified as what is particular to the husband as an image of the love of Christ for his church, right? He lays down his life in sacrifice so as to defend, right? So as to provide, so as ultimately to lead his bride, uh, right? Or effectively his family into the fullness. So yeah, it's wild. What we're talking about here is serious business, big time business, beautiful business. But our Lord loves us with this kind of love. And so when we come across that passage where the Sadducees approach Jesus to say, there's a lady, she gets married, her husband dies, no kids. All right, his brother picks up the task, he dies, no kids. Okay, seven brothers, they all die, no children. Whose wife will she be in heaven? And he says, in heaven, you will neither be married nor given in marriage, okay? Why, in what sense? Well, in heaven, marriage will pass away, not in so far as like, Spouses will be separated at the threshold. I'm not talking about that. But in the sense that there won't be need of the sign of marriage because we'll all abide in the reality thereof. Okay, so you don't need signs when you have realities. You don't need faith when you have vision. You don't need hope when you have possession. Okay, you see where this is going. You don't need sacraments in heaven. There are no sacraments in heaven because the things that the sacraments convey, which they cause as they signify, are just, they're just immediately present, right? And so our Lord is saying, you have neither to be married nor given in marriage because each will be wed to me. The covenant, right, which is fashioned in my blood, the blood and water which poured forth my side, giving rise to the sacraments of baptism and the most holy Eucharist, this whole dispensation of grace, virtue, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which will safeguard you unto ages of ages, will be had in me, in my flesh, in the vision of God the Father, right, in the vision of the Godhead of the most triune God, by the mediation of my sacred humanity. And so our Lord is saying, you'll, you'll be mine, perfectly, exclusively, wholly and entirely. And that's enough. That's more than enough. That's everything for which our minds seek and our hearts long. 
So when we talk about our Lord as a bridegroom God, when we talk about Jesus as the bridegroom, it's some of these things to which we're referring. Um, so for those who are more expert on this than I, like Father Paulo Prosperi and Dr. Brant Petrie, uh, please do correct any excesses or defects or blatant errors. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's basically what I wanted to share. So this is Pints with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, and get email updates when other cool things come out on the channel. If you haven't yet, check out God's Planning, which is a podcast to which I contribute with four other Dominican friars. Weekly episodes, 30 minutes, nice and short. A couple of guests every month, a couple of live streams every month, and sweet opportunities for retreats and things like that beyond. And then I also wrote a book. It's called Prudence. Choose confidently, live boldly. There are no mentions to Jesus the Bridegroom, but... There are mentions to other things which are helpful for seeking to know and to love Jesus the Bridegroom and to shape a coherent life in the following of Him. So, boom. All right, know of my prayers for you. Please pray for me. I'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Pines with Aquinas.